Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Father, I thank you for this amazing opportunity. I thank you for this wonderful church. Holy Spirit, help me to lift up Jesus today because that's all we want. We want Jesus to be lifted up and we want Jesus to be glorified because we are nothing more than just simply dirt and water. But it's your spirit, the zoe of God that is breathed into us that makes this earthen vessel so valuable today. And so we honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, iPhones, iPads, electronic device, whatever you're going to use, I'm going to ask that you turn to two opening scriptures. The first one is going to be found in Romans, the 8th chapter. And then I want you to uh, turn over to 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John 2 first. But I want to talk a little bit about the title is, is simply, Love Always Finds a Way. Love always finds a way. Away, And especially with your theme, is there not a cause? I mean, that would be a great cause to get up every morning and to live for Jesus. The love thing. Love always finds a way. In 1 John, we're going to read 1 John first, verse John 2. How many of you know there's a definition of love by the world and then there's Jesus' definition? The definition of the Bible. We're going to find out that they're polar opposites. Because here's what the Bible says in 1 John, I'm sorry, chapter 3, chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16. By this we know love, know love. He's saying by this I'm going to describe to you, we're going to understand and comprehend love. Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now notice the word ought, ought is not a suggestion, not as a commandment. And he goes on and he says this. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has this world's goods, he's describing love, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word and in tongue, but let us love in deed and in truth. Now go over, if you would, to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans, the eighth chapter. In Romans the 8th chapter and starting in verse number 35, again, he's going to describe a little bit about this love. He says in verse number 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now he's going to list all these things and he's saying, shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are all killed like sheep all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, here's more lists, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us, second time he's going to say that, from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Many of us are familiar with this verse. Nothing can separate. Nothing will ever stop God from loving you. In our failures, in our defeats, in our disappointments, in the greatest crisis or heartaches of our lives, God will never stop loving you, no matter what. So we understand that. That love will never stop coming from God to you. But here's where the breakdown is. If we really believe that love will never stop coming to you, do we really believe and practice that love will never stop going through me? See, when we're talking about vertically, nothing can separate the love of God from heaven to me, from God's heart to me. He's always going to love me. But sometimes there's a breakdown in the horizontal that that love is not always channeled through me because you don't know the ex-boss that I have. You don't know the ex-pastor that I have. You don't know the neighbor that I'm dealing with. You don't know my family member. See, we can all boldly say, yes, I know that love will never be stopped or separated to me. But we often have a breakdown in believing that love should be stopped or separated through us to other people. And that's not true. Not true at all. Love always finds Away. The Bible is full of examples of love always finding a way. Isn't that the story of Joseph with his brothers? 
Love found a way to love these guys that were going to kill him, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. Love through Joseph found a way to love him, love his brothers. How about the story of the prodigal? Love found a way. A man beaten on a road, probably his fault. A notorious road where robbers are and he, everyone, maybe the priest and the Levites said, shame on you, your fault, you shouldn't have been here. But that's not the example that the Samaritan, nor does he think that way. He binds his womb, you know the story, sets him on his own animal, takes him to the inn, pays for it, spends all night with him, and leaves a deposit and said, if there's any more expenses, I'll pay for it. Love found a way. The four friends that had a friend that was paralyzed found a way to get Jesus, to get this man to Jesus, because love always finds a way. David found a way to go after the Ark of the Covenant where others had forsaken it, especially Saul himself. But love found a way. How many of you know that's the message of the cross? Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter and love found a way to die for us, redeem us, become our sacrifice, our sacrifice, our propitiation, make us righteous, forgive us, give us airship and make us sons of God. Love always finds a way. There's a great story of a man, Christian man, his name is Kurt Warner. Maybe some of you are familiar with him as the St. Louis Rams quarterback, MVP, who won one of the Super Bowls. But he married a woman named Brenda who had two children from a previous marriage, Jesse Joe and Zachary. But Zachary has a disability. His father dropped him, literally dropped him when he was four months old. And he went through brain damage. Doctors said he would never see, walk, talk, or sit up. Today he has a little bit of blurred vision, but he's actually healed and healthy. Kurt adopted, Kurt Warner adopted these two children and gave him his name Warner. Since then, they've adopted five more children because love always finds a way to love children that aren't my own, to love children that maybe don't meet up with perfection and have disability, to go out and find children that are lost and hurting and don't have love. In the 2000 NFA, NFC Championship, young 10-year-old Zach, wrote a homemade card and he handed it to him. And it said this, you are, as, you are as good of a dad as you are a quarterback. Isn't that what it's all about? Love always, love always finds a way. You know, there's a story of long distance love, Tyrell and Joanna Wolf. And uh, this was done through Operation Christmas Child where People, little kids wrap up a little Christmas gift in a shoebox and send it to a third world country to a child uh, that doesn't have privileges that we Americans do. And they send it off to Joanna, Tyrell did. And all that was in that box was a picture of this eight-year-old boy and where he lived. And there came a chance when Joanna finally came to America. She was a teenager. And years later, she spent all the time trying to find this man named Tyrell, and 14 years later, they're married today. Because love always finds a way. Love finds a way to love the unlovable, the undeserving, the unsuitable, the unwanted, the unworthy, and absolutely the unfit. I want you to turn now in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Hosea, to the book of Hosea. And I want to use Hosea as an example of love finding a way. Since this is man's day, and this is a day to have a cause, what a great example to us as men to talk about a great man, a prophet. Now, if you don't know where Hosea is, you're not trying to impress anybody. Just go to the table of contents and look where Hosea is. Because by the time you find it, the sermon's going to be over. He marries a girl named Gomer. Now, most men would say, I'd never marry a girl named Gomer. Now, listen, I ain't talking about Gomer, Gomer Pyle. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Or oh, Shazam. This was, this was the given name at that particular time. 
We're going to read a little bit about the setting that took place here. We're going to pass through some scriptures real, real quick. In Hosea 1, verse number 2, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and he took Gomer. Then you could go on and you could see in verse number four, they both had a child. That child's name was Jezreel. Jezreel means God plants. Then in verse number six, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the daughter's name was Lo Rehama, which means no mercy. Then you go down to the latter part of ver or verse nine, and she had another child, a son, and his name was Lo Ami, which means not my people. Then we're going to go over to chapter 3, and it's going to pick up. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again. Say that word with me, go again. Amen. Which means something preceded that. Something may have stopped or discontinued. And God tells Hosea to go back and give it another try. He says, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover. Oh my God, is this what I'm reading? Harlotry, children of harlotry, and is committing adultery. I mean, who needs to watch television like Scandal when you've got a Bible? I don't know how people say, I get nothing out of the Bible. It's boring. My God, how rich is this story? I want to know more. And the Lord said, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Booyah, right in your face right now. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of pagans. So I bought her. He went and he bought her. This who? This woman that was committing adultery. This wife of his. For her, I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the heart. Look at what he's saying over her. He's saying over his hurt. He's saying over his mistrust. He's saying over his pain. He's not saying you deserve it. You're no good. You're going to sleep outside. That's my bank account. You know what? You're not going to get nothing. You're going to, I'm going to retaliate. He doesn't speak those words. He goes on. He says, you shall stay with me many days. I'm bringing security girl in your life. He says, you shall not play the harlot anymore. I'm trusting you that you're not going back to that lifestyle. And he says, nor shall you have a man, so I will be toward you. What an interesting story here today of love finding a way. Hosea found a way to love the unlovable called Gomer. This guy, listen, when you read the scriptures, you need to understand that this is real. Much like you and I go through pains, hurts, and violation. There's nothing over spiritual about what you're reading that he was protecting him from emotions and feelings. He had everything that you and I would have. Now when you read this story, it is a picture showing that God is, is, is Gomer, excuse me, God is Hosea and the children of Israel are Gomer. It's an, it's an example of how faithful God has been to us while we have been a gomer and been unfaithful to him. But it actually is a story of a man and a woman's relationship. Any of you married? Any of you once were married? Raise your hand. How many of you remember how it was when you first started dating? Wasn't it glorious? Wasn't it wonderful? Can you remember how wonderful it was on your matrimony day, the day you got married? I got married in Pomona. I went to the Elks Lodge in, in Roland Heights. We had the taco man. <laughs> Here it is with Hosea and Gomer. They are absolutely falling in love with one another. They are preparing for their marriage. I mean, she is trying on dresses. He's trying to figure out the right tux. He purchasing the ring. They're going out and getting the invitations. They're tasting the wedding cakes and the meal. They are excited about everything. The day of the wedding shows up and just like every woman, she's late. And just like every guy, his knees are buckling. He's forgetting the vows. It's just a typical wedding. 
But the crowd is wonderful as they usher into the reception. They're playing all kinds of music and they're eating each other's cake and putting it in their face. They're opening the presents in the garter and the whole nine yards. And then they go on their honeymoon. And I don't know if Al Green was playing. I don't know if Barry White was playing. I don't know if Let's Get It On when Marvin Gaye was playing. But you know what? It was a wonderful time. They came home and had their first little apartment and they, they furnished it. And uh, it was a real exciting time. They called each other pet names. You know how young honeymooners do? Pookie, Peanut, Buttercup, Lollipop. Makes you sick when you get around people like that. They were in love. It couldn't get any better. Then all of a sudden, Hosea goes off to work, and he comes back. And when he comes home, Gomer says, you'll never guess I'm pregnant. He says, "Woohoo! what is it? And she tells him it's a boy. He says, yeah, I'm so excited. But you know what? In the days to come, all of a sudden, she'd say, you know what? I'm going to go hang out with my girlfriends tonight. Don't wait up. I won't be coming home early. And it went on maybe for a day, and then it went on for a week, and then it went on for a month, and who knows how long. And all of a sudden, she was running the streets. And all of a sudden, she was sleeping in other men's beds. And you know what? It's not like the population of today where, you know what, there's hundreds of thousands of people in our cities. These are very small communities who probably went to the same well, who shopped at the same little market or interacted together. So this would have been well known. And men could have easily gotten around Hosea and shared their experience. Or this would have been rumored and everybody would have known about it. But amazingly in this setting, God is telling him to go back and to love this woman. And I just want to spend the few moments that I have with you to share three quick points that you and I can learn about love always finding a way. It's easy to annul and divorce people and separate and dis disconnect ourselves and split and alienate and detach and disassociate and cut off and isolate ourselves from people. People like Gomer that have lied to us. People that broke their vows to us. People that don't appreciate what I'm doing for them. People that are not thankful. I don't think you've ever said thankful that you're thankful to me. Gomer are people that take advantage of us, take advantage of our goodness or our niceness. And I'm not talking necessarily right now about a spouse. It could be anybody in our lives because there's all types of Gomers in our lives. These are people that continue to repeat the offense over and over. It'd be one thing if Gomer did it one time, but she has a lifestyle and she never repents from it. And you and I are going to meet people like that. And that's why Jesus says that I'm to forgive seven times 70, 490 times in just one day over the same offense. So there are people that are going to repeat the wrong that they do to us and they're not going to be repentant. There's going to be unfair treatment. They're going to be mean-spirited. Or let me use a word that we used to do, use back in the day, cold-blooded. Some people are just cold-blooded. And this girl, she's cold-blooded. Absolutely cold-blooded. She doesn't care who knows, and she's not going to change. And there are people like that. And when we get around these kinds of people, all of a sudden, it births bad things in us. Just like bad children that came from the relationship. See, the first child was theirs. Here's the amazing thing. The other two children, the other two children were not Hosea's. They were someone else's baby. Someone else's baby, mama, daddy, baby. That was a little Maury Povich line or whatever, I don't know. But you know what? He's going to take them in and he's going to love them like Jezreel, his own. And he's not going to be unfair toward them and he's not going to mistreat them. And they're going to get all the privileges of this great prophet and this great man of God. But sometimes I get around people and they bring out the worst in me. Every time I get around it, th there's strife, there's division, there's debt. It's birthed that through the relationship. But I'm going to find a way to love no matter what. And here's the point. Here's the point that I want to show us today. 
We may have the right to do something, but we never have the power to it. Because right comes from the flesh and power comes by God. Let me explain to you what I mean. I I want you to recognize Hosea has the right to leave her and never come back, kick her to the curb, remarry, and move on. He has a right to do that. Maybe he has a right to go find another woman, get remarried, or go cheat on her. He has a right to do that. How many of you know we live here in a democratic society called America, and everybody says they have Rights. And, you know, if my rights are not heard or my rights are not going to be met, you're going to hear from my lawyer, Larry H. Parker. I have rights. And if I don't like something, I'm protesting. I'm picketing. How many of you know in the kingdom of God, you don't have no rights? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I that live, but Christ that liveth through me. Not my will, but his will. So it's easy for us to get in the flesh and say, I have a right to get even or retaliate or to hurt or to be vindictive. But right comes from the flesh. You may have the right to do something, but you don't have the power to. Power comes from God's consent. So when you and I are tempted to do something, why don't you go to God and ask him, God, what do you want me to do? Because I'll tell you, God, what I feel like doing in the flesh. And I promise you, God is going to speak something that relates more to love than the flesh. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? Here's Here's a great example. The great example is this. David has a right to take Saul out. Saul is for 10 years running him upside the wilderness, trying to kill him. Trying to murder him. David, his son-in-law, hasn't done nothing to hurt him. Only propagated his kingdom and been a loyal servant. But notice what the scriptures tell us about David in his heart. He said, I will not touch God's anointed. I'm not going to do it. The throne is not going to come by my hand. If I'm ever going to be a king, God is going to promote me. God is going to evaluate me. God is going to give me. I don't need to manipulate nothing. I don't need to make nothing happen. I don't need to get my name out there. I don't need to hobnob. I don't need to style and profile. God knows my address. God knows how faithful I am. But I just want you to see what a great example that David never took it upon himself to get that throne. He led it up to God. And so you may have a right to do something, but only God can give you the permission and the authority to do it. Here's point number two that I want to share with you. It's found in Matthew, the fifth chapter. I know you know this verse, but let's look at it again like it's, we're seeing it for the first time in Matthew chapter five and verse 43. Because in spite of all that Gomer was and did and said and be to Hosea, God says, go again. Try again. Pursue her. Give it your best shot. Go again. Failure, disappointment, heartache, rejection the first time. But God is saying, go again. Go again. In Matthew, the fifth chap- Matthew 5, in verse number 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you to love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. Polar opposites of what our flesh wants to do. This is what God says. I'm going through something right now with literally my next door neighbor. Now, it was one time, but now it's progressed another time. I was out there just minding my own business with my two little dogs doing yard work, and I feel like someone's watching me. Have you ever known when someone's watching? I turn my head, and I look, and there's just a head over the wall. And, and he says, man, I just finished listening to you online, one of your sermons. So I lit up. I mean, that's a good thing. I said, which one were you listening to? He said, it, your testimony about God healing you. I lit up even more. He looked at me, and he said, you're ridiculous. Well, I thought he meant you're awesome. That's wonderful. 
he meant, he meant the opposite of stupid. He said, you're a false prophet. How dare you say that God healed you of cancer? He went like this to me, and he went into the house as he was talking to his little dog and said, we ain't going to listen to that false prophet. Well, the other day, I mean, I, um, I, I was chipping some balls in my backyard, just chipping, just chipping with a club, and I accidentally hit one over his fence. I thought to myself, should I jump it and get it? And I said, but Diego, if he's there, then you're going to, you know, you're, it's, it's not going to turn out. Just leave it alone. So the next morning I get up and I see a ball. And when I'm chipping him back there, I always pick him up because I don't want the dogs to get him. So I thought, oh, well, maybe I left one there and the dog found it. So I wanted to go over there right away. He wrote this terrible message on the ball. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, I may have the right to get a golf ball and write my own message and throw it over there. But I don't have the power to do that. And I'm finding scriptures like this that says love finds a way, Diego, to pray and to bless and to do good. So I want you to recognize that everything that Gomer was, he, in spite of, it's amazing to me, it's amazing to me that God doesn't seem to be considerate of Hosea's opinion here or his feelings. It's almost as though God is ignoring how Gomer is living. God, why are you on my back? Have you ever felt that way? God, why are you hassling me? Why are you telling me to do something? Why don't you go do something about this woman over here? Why don't you do something about this person who is blatantly sinning or doing wrong, God? Why are you on my back to walk in love, to forgive, to invite him to a party, to send him to an, send an invitation out? In the natural, God doesn't seem to be considerate right now of Hosea's opinion. He is not having a counseling session with Hosea asking him, do you want to do this? And God is not going to ask you He's going to tell us. Because God always is thinking about our best interest. He's always thinking about something that's going to better our life or better the kingdom of God. So I want you to know, if we're trying to find what I'm calling roadblocks to loving someone, you're going to find them. You're going to find them. It's amazing. Have you ever looked at ants? And when ants come against a little bit of a stick or roadblock, they always find a way to go around it. They never let the roadblock stop them. Maybe you're familiar with a tree fell down in 1969, while Winona tree in Yosemite. And we made, they made a hole through it. They found a way to get around the roadblock. And you and I are going to have to get around our roadblocks that, that have excuses why I can't love this person. Why don't they don't deserve my love? Get around the oppositions and the obstacles that we have to face. Get around there so unworthy, God. You don't know how long they've done this kind of excuses. God, it's too hard. I can't. You're going to have to overcome all those roadblocks that try to stop you to tell you you can't walk in love toward this person. I'm with a church for 15 years, nine years full time. I go to my pastor and I say, you know what? I feel that God's called me to be a senior pastor. I don't know much about um, when, where, and how. I submit whatever you want to do. It's not going to happen right away. I'm just laying it before you. And, and I want you to know it was a terrible uh, situation within that church because the male had committed adultery and, they want, and had left the female. So I was dealing with the female. She said, come back in 24 hours. I'll pray and we'll see what the Lord tells me. In 24 hours, I came back and my desk was cleared out and all my stuff put in a box. And she told me to go obey God. And if I'd like to, I can write a letter and she'll read it in front of the congregation that I've been there 15 years and nine years full time on my behalf. Needless to say, I was hurt. Every emotion, and if I could be honest with you, uh, bitterness, grudges, even maybe hatred rose up within me. I wish I could tell you that I said hallelujah, and I kissed her on the cheek, and I said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And I looked up to heaven and said, Lord, forgive her, for she know not what she do. I didn't do that. It was so bad that I could not hear her name in a conversation. It was so bad that if I saw her in her car in, a commun in the community, I couldn't look at her. I would tremble. I would tremble. Well, shortly after that, uh, the, I found out that she was ill. 
and the Lord put it on my heart to go and visit her. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to go visit her. No, hey, there ain't no way when so-and-so freezes over, I, I ain't going there. I really felt like God impressed it. Did it leave? How many of you know that's a sign that it's God? It just doesn't leave you. 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 It didn't leave me. This overwhelming desire to go. And so I've really felt like God said, I want you to take your wife and I want you to take your three young boys. So we loaded up and we went. We spent two hours. It was very pleasurable. We were reminiscing. But as we ended the conversation, I got in the car and I was very, very upset with God. I held the steering wheel in my hand in the 10-2 position as Cindy loaded the kids up in their baby chairs. Didn't even help her because I was so upset with God. And this was my thought to God. You set me up. You set me, you royally set me up, didn't you? I said, I thought I was coming here to get an apology. That's why I thought you wanted me to come here to get the apology. And for the last two hours, she didn't even say one time she was wrong. She didn't apologize one time. There was not one regret. And I believe my theology might be wrong. But I believe that God speaks to us in the language that we are familiar with. So if you're going to get my attention, you can't talk softly to me. Diego. You have to get in my face. And I really felt like God said, is that why you came today? For the apology. And then it got louder. Is that why you came today for the apology? Louder, third time louder. Is that why you came today, Diego, to get an apology from her? And I put my head down. The solemn moment, I can't say that I've heard from God in my lifetime, very, very few times, but I know I heard from God then. And I put my head down and said, no, I did not come for an apology. I came because you asked me to come. And at the end of the day, love always finds a way. I'm going to close it out with my, one of my last points. I have a brother. His name is Brian. Brian lived in Temecula, and he had a wonderful wife, and he had two kids. And um, his wife took a, 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 a job at night. To make a long story short, she began to commit adultery and have an affair. Brian's a believing man. He approached her. He tried to believe God and trust God for restoration for the year. Uh, to come back, but it finally ended in a divorce because uh, she said, I'm never going to leave this guy. I'm just never going to leave you, the guy. And so Brian decided to go live, it, move in with my mom and dad and give her the home, give her the home because he said, I want my kids to sleep in the same bedroom and, and go to the same school. Shortly after that, the new guy moved into Brian's home where Brian is paying the mortgage. Let me know when you say, ouch, and you want me to stop. This guy, this guy can't find any work. He, they, they, get, they finally get married. So Brian's business is prospering so much. This is during the Vegas boom. He opened up another business in Vegas, and she asked him, she asked Brian, can I have, be released uh, to take our children out of state? And Brian agreed to it so that he could follow, uh, go get a contracting job over there. He couldn't find nothing. So Brian goes to him and says, listen, I was going to open another business. I'm going to open it in Vegas. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you a business partner in my business. For every year that you're faithful, I will let you buy me out 10%. And over 10 years, you will own my company. Let me know when you can't handle no more. Shortly after that, this guy goes to her and says, how could you leave him for me? I want to know the God that this man serves. And he gives his heart to Jesus Christ. He prompts this backslidden girl to go to church. And now they're going to church. So this guy says whenever, because Brian would have to go check up on his business every couple weeks. He'd say, every time you come to Vegas, I want you to sleep in our house. So he's sleeping in the room next to his ex-wife and her husband. Today, if you saw them, they go out to dinner together. They laugh and all their kids are around each other. Love always finds a way. I asked him, why could you do that? How could you do it? Because he said, I never thought about my feelings. 
And I never wanted to use my kids as a punching bag to talk about their mama and how she did it to me. They would eventually find out on their own, but until then, I was going to love them and think about them. In conclusion, here's the last thought I want to share with you. There's only, uh, the, the only way for Hosea to find a way to love Gomer, how is, excuse me, how is Hosea going to find a way to love Gomer, to cover her and clean her and touch her again and protect her and provide for her? How are we able to love the unlovable? Love always finds a way. You have to do it as unto the Lord. That's how you're going to have to do it. It's the only way for us to walk in this place. Colossians 3.17 challenges us to do that. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea is going to have to love Gomer and do it as unto the Lord. He's going to have to leave the results up to God. There's no guarantee that she's ever going to go back to this lifestyle or she's ever going to change or what, or the future of their marriage is ever going to get better. And sometimes you just got to trust God and leave the results up to God. As I venture out to try to restore. Love always finds a way, church. Love always finds a way to pick up the phone. Love always finds a way to text. Love always finds a way to help and to pray for. Love always finds. But you don't know, preacher. I'm fighting custody battles right now. There are lawsuits going on right now. There's restraining orders. I can't see my kids because of what's going on. But I'm here to tell you, love always finds a way. It always finds one. If you're looking for a blockade, you're going to find it. If you're looking for an excuse, you're going to find it. And I'm saying that with a whole lot of passion for you because I know sometimes it's tough in these blended families. But love will always find a way. So if that means you're one week vacation a year, you take a plane trip to that state, you stand on a corner, you wait for your child to come by, you hand them a birthday card and say, Daddy loves you, I'll see you a year from now. Love always finds a way. We'll always find a way. So he has to leave the results up to God. He has to get his eyes off of Gomer and what she's done to him. And what, he, what he's doing, he has to do by faith. There's no feelings. I promise you, when God says when she's on the auction block, her pimp had sold her into slavery. She's half naked. And at that point, that's when God says, go buy her back. There's no hallelujah, praise the Lord. I'm so excited. This is an answer to prayer. What he is doing, he is doing by faith. And feelings have nothing to do with it. It's not going to feel good sometimes. And it's not going to feel any better any time. Sometime. And last of all, you've got to rely upon Jesus to give you grace with that person, to give you favor with that person. You've got to rely upon humility that you're not going to be mean spirited or ugly while you're doing something in the name of the Lord. You've got to rely upon God's strength, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to do what God's asking you to do. And you've got to ask God for wisdom. God, give me a plan and strategy, God, that I'm not foolish, that I don't cast my pearls before a swine, oh God. That I don't just reopen myself up, self up to be a victim again, God. So I really need your wisdom. How do I deal with this relationship? My last story, and I'm closing. I have a very, very good friend. I spoke at his conference just a few years ago. We got together before I spoke to meet each other. And upon at that dinner sharing stories, we recognized that 25 years before, we knew each other. We had met because we, again, were youth pastors at other churches in which those senior pastors knew each other. And we're rem 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 reminiscing, and where our faces had changed, we got older, but we, we remembered each other again. And at that particular time, what had happened 25 years before was that he had a senior pastor that he loved very much, and he had a wife, and they had three young boys, like me. And what happened was his senior pastor went and had an affair with his wife. He was the youth pastor. They left the church. They left the church, and she left her three boys, and he had to go. The church fired him immediately, even though he had nothing to do with it. It was just too much of a pain. They didn't know what to do with him. He went to go live in the garage of his mom and dad's house, with all kinds of issues of resentment and bitterness. Today, if I told you we are all going to get in a van 
and we are going to go over to the city of Monrovia, and I'm going to introduce you to my friend, the friend I've just given you information about. Uh, we'll all get in there and I'll say, hey, this is my pastor friend, and you'll shake his hand with great emotion because you know his story, and you might hug him and kiss him a little bit and feel a little bit of what he's went through. Now, all of a sudden, he'll introduce his new wife to you, and you'll greet her. And then he'll, he'll turn to his right, and he'll say, I'd like to introduce you to my assistant pastor. And you'll reach out with a smile to embrace his assistant pastor, but he proceeds to tell you, this is my former senior pastor that I used to be a youth pastor for 25 years ago. And you'll stand back because you just have knowledge of what I told you. And you'll scratch your head. And then as we go a little further in, in, in the office, we'll go by a, a secretary, and he'll say, I'd like to introduce you to one of the secretaries here, and it's his ex-wife. And they're just like one big happy family. They go on vacations together and one time live four houses away from each other. How could you do that? Because of what I just shared with you, I do it as unto the Lord. I've got to put my feelings aside. I have to trust God. And I have to walk in wisdom and so many other things. I'm ended this story. You've been great for listening. But I want to just challenge you today. Maybe your love walk is being challenged today. Maybe there's someone that has royally hurt you. Maybe somewhere in your life there's a gomer that has mistreated you. Maybe you've settled today for the excuses. I can't. It's too hard and it's too difficult. The obstacles are too great for me to love this person. But I'm going to ask you if you've heard from God today that you're going to have a moment right now. So I just want us right now to just have a moment with God and connect the dots of this message right now. Let the Lord minister to your heart today. Is there any area of your life where, where you could love someone? That love can find a way. If he laid down his life for you, can you lay down your feelings, your emotions, your will for him? Can you find a way to love someone? that has royally hurt you, ripped you off. Father, right now, we come before you now. We open our hearts. And I pray that you would heal people today, God. Heal them of the brokenness and the emptiness that's within their life. Free us from any form of bitterness, resentment, even hatred that we have towards someone that has done us wrong, God. And show us that love can always find a way. If your love found a way to love us that were unlovable, didn't deserve, then we have an obligation to allow nothing to separate us from the love of God that we'll give to others, God. So I ask now, God, for you to mend a relationship. God, sometimes these things don't always turn out right in the natural, but they turn out right from heaven's perspective because we obeyed you, God. I pray today, oh God, that relationships are mended today. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you leave this place, I don't want to take it for granted on this Saturday morning that everyone is born again and saved. Here's what I know. You and I are one germ, one virus, one accident or mishap away from heaven's gate or hell's doors. And tomorrow's not promised to any single one of us. People that die are not old people in hospices, 90 years old. They're people that look like you and I and are our age. How does it happen? They get on a highway or a freeway and they never get off because a drunk driver runs into them or they fall asleep at a wheel or they're rear-ended by a semi. How do I know that? Because I'm a pastor of a church and that happens. How, how does it happen? People check into a hospital with minor surgery, but this time something happens on the operating table. Doctors can't even explain it. They, they don't know this person just died. Or how does it happen? You've done something a thousand times that's of no risk, but this time something breaks and you're killed instantly. How do I know this? Because I'm a pastor and it happens. I'm not trying to put gloom and doom. I pray you live another hundred years, but should it not happen, I want to take away the mystery of where you're going to spend eternity. There's too much at jeopardy to you for you to risk and to wish. You've got to know for sure. You've got to be guaranteed today. And Jesus is the guarantor. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No other name where we could be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life today. And if you can't remember one moment in your lifetime, maybe you were like me who grew up in religion, had religion in your head but not in your heart. You didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
I want you to give your life to, to Jesus. He's not here to judge you. He's not here to condemn you. He's not here to punish you today. He's here to love you and forgive you today. You have a void in your heart, and you can try to fill it with all kinds of stuff. And it makes you happy for a moment, then you're restless again. The only one that could fill the void in your life is Jesus Christ. Come to him today. Or you say, you know, I'm a Christian, but it's been a long time since I felt close to God. There's some unconfessed sins in my life. I want to renew or rededicate my relationship to Jesus Christ. When I count to three, as bold as I'm raising my hand, that's why I want you to raise your hand. Why? Because there was a time when you were bold in this world. That's the way we come to Christ. If he could die naked, marred, and beaten on a tree suspended between earth and heaven, that's the way I'm coming to Christ, unashamed. You give your heart to Jesus Christ today. He loves you today. We're in a friendly environment. Nobody will judge you. One, two, you raise your hand and we'll pray for you. One, two, three, raise your hand all across this auditorium, wherever you might be. Wherever you might be, God bless you. God bless you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask anybody who's raising their hands, or maybe you didn't raise your hands, but you want in on this prayer. I'm going to ask all of you to step out of the aisle and come forward and allow us to pray with you. Come forward right now, wherever you are. Come on, church. Let's celebrate people that are going to make this commitment to Jesus Christ. In Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that. Here's what I'm going to do, guys. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right now. I could give you the words, but I can't give you the heart. I want you to mean this prayer from your heart. Just say, raise your hand. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I am what I am. I'm not fooling you. You've seen everything. But I thank you today for telling me how much you love me. Today, in front of all these men, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He died on the cross to forgive me of my wicked sins. For the rest of my life, I will follow you, Lord. I walk from this place today knowing that I am forgiven. I am a child of God. And I will tell somebody as soon as I can that I am saved in Jesus' name. Praise God. You guys go in this direction real quick. Go follow Pastor Joel. Go to your left. They're going to give some information to you. God bless you, Rock. Thanks for listening. God love you. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.